Okay, so today we'll finish up 6b, maybe even start 6c. We're talking about orthonormal bases. All right, so just to recall from last time, an orthonormal basis is just a basis that's also an orthonormal list. In other words, every vector is orthogonal to every other one, and they all have norm 1, just like the standard basis. And the main, really the main technique that, that you should remember from last time is this Gram-Schmidt procedure, which takes any linearly independent list and spits out an orthonormal list that has the same span, right? It's particularly given by these formulas, which shows that every vector space has an orthonormal basis because every vector, sorry, every finite dimensional vector space has an orthonormal basis, because every finite dimensional vector space has a basis, and then you run it through Gram-Schmidt, what it spits out is an orthonormal list that has the same span, so that must be a basis of your vector space. That's where we left off. Okay, uh, but you may remember when you were proving things, when we were first learning about bases, is that sometimes it's not enough just to know that a basis exists. Sometimes what you want to do is you want to start with a particular basis of a subspace, say, and extend it to a basis of the whole space. So sometimes not enough to know, right, when you're doing some homework problems or whatever, or proving something in class, not enough to know that a basis exists. Sometimes you want to know, you can start with a linearly independent list. And extend it to a basis. Right? Sometimes you want to start your basis out in a particular way. I will say that the same thing is true for orthonormal bases. Sometimes it's not enough to know that a vector space has an orthonormal basis. Right, which we, we know now, but sometimes you want something stronger than that. Sometimes you want to know that you can start with any, you can replace this with orthonormal list and extend it to an orthonormal basis. In other words, you can start an orthonormal basis however you want. Okay, the reason why you can replace linearly independent with orthonormal is we proved that orthogonal or we prove that orthonormal implies linearly independent, so that'll be automatic. And luckily for us, this is true. And like I said, from just your homework exercises, from proving things in lecture, you should know that, I mean, you should have some idea that this might be a useful result. So suppose that V is finite dimensional, then every orthonormal list in V again, which will be automatically linearly independent, can be extended to an orthonormal basis of V. Okay, so let me give you the proof idea. Okay, the, the proof idea is we, we're gonna start with some orthonormal list, right? This is going to be an orthonormal list. And so we're going to want to start our basis with that, right? Because we, we want an orthonormal basis in the end. Then what, well, what should we do? Well, we know that we can definitely take any linearly independent list and extend it to a basis, right? So then you extend to a basis. So it's going to start with our E's. And then we're going to maybe add on some V's. This is a basis of V. But of course, it's not, it's not orthonormal yet, right? Only the first m vectors are orthogonal to each other and are norm one. Here, I've just added any old vectors that take you to a basis. And the idea is to Gram-Schmidt this guy. Which will produce an orthonormal basis of V. Right? But the question is, is will this actually be extending our original orthonormal list? 
In other words, if you run Graham Schmidt on this list, are you going to change the first M? Okay, so the important thing that this will leave E1 through EM unchanged, which I think is not obvious. We need to think about why. But it is true that actually this process will leave, leave an orthonormal basis, and the first M vectors will just be the ones that you started with. If you start with an orthonormal list, Gram Schmidt doesn't do anything. Why is this? So in the jth step, where J is between 1 and M, right? So in the first, when we're first doing Gram Schmidt, we first look at E1, then E2, et cetera. The way that you get uh, the next vector is the next vector is, well, you start with EJ and then you subtract off uh, this vector projected onto the first one up to EJ minus one, uh, sorry, EJ, EJ minus one, EJ minus one. And then you divide through by the norm. But the point is, is that since E1 through EM was already an orthonormal list, all of these are just zero. So in the end, what you just get is you get EJ over the norm of EJ. But again, the E's form an orthonormal list, so this was just EJ. OK, so this is just the proof idea. I mean, you know, I wrote the proof in complete sentences in uh, in the notes, but the idea is just you take the orthonormal as you want, you augment up to a basis, which you can do, you run Gram Schmidt, and it doesn't affect the first m vectors. So this is kind of an, an, a nice thing. Now if you're in any problem and you start with an orthonormal list, so you have an orthonormal basis of a subspace, you want to get an orthonormal basis of the whole vector space, you can use this result to say, okay, by proposition whatever, we can extend to an orthonormal basis of V. Okay. Another thing you could ask is, okay, well, which subspaces can I hope to get orthonormal bases for? Okay, well, the, the answer as I the answer to the question as I asked is any of them because every finite dimensional vector space admits an orthonormal basis. Maybe what I'm saying is. If we have some theorem telling us about some basis, can we add the word orthonormal? So here's, here's what I'm thinking about. Uh, recall that if T is an operator on V, V is finite dimensional, and T is diagonalizable, maybe, maybe I'll put it say this way, T is diagonalizable. In other words, there's a basis of V such that the matrix of T is the diagonal matrix. This is if and only if there exists a basis of V consisting of eigenvectors of T. These two things are equivalent. Uh, so the question I'm asking is, well, when can I add the word orthonormal to some statement about a basis and hope for it to still be true, right? Like this result, uh, every linearly independent list can be extended to, an, to a basis. It was possible to add the word orthonormal and still get a true statement. Every orthonormal list can be extended to an orthonormal basis. What about this statement? Can I, can I add orthonormal here? Yeah, but the answer is no, definitely not, right? So can't expect to be able to add the word orthonormal here. Right, just for some small example, say we're in R2, and let's say that T has 
two eigenvectors, I mean, two, two eigenvalues, and one of the eigenspaces is spanned by one zero, and one of the eigenspaces is spanned by one one. Okay, this is certainly very possible, right? So if T has two eigenvalues, let's say lambda one and lambda two, and the eigenspaces are one dimensional with uh, the eigenspace of lambda one being the span of say one zero and the eigenspace of lambda two being say one one. Then if this could happen, which it can, you should try to actually construct an example. Uh, then T is definitely diagonalizable because it has a basis of eigenvectors, right? However, these two subspaces are, represent all of the eigenvectors of T, right? These are all the eigenvalues with the second eigenvalue. Eigen, these are all the eigenvectors with that second eigenvalue. These are all the vectors with that first eigenvalue. So there's no way that I can get an orthonormal basis of V consisting of eigenvectors of T. I don't have any, I don't have any choice. I mean, okay, I, I do have choice. I can choose any vector along this, any non-zero vector in this subspace. And I can choose any non-zero vector in this subspace, but I can never hope to get these vectors orthogonal. Right, so uh, V has a basis of eigenvectors of T. but not an orthonormal basis of, of eigenvectors of T. Okay, so orthonormal bases are really, really nice, but that doesn't mean that every time you see some statement about some kind of basis that you could always hope to get an orthonormal basis instead. You're not, you're not always guaranteed to be able to find a basis that's as nice as you want. Okay, so how to say this another way, i.e. just because uh, if there is a basis of V such that the matrix of T is diagonal, This does not imply there's an orthonormal basis of V such that the matrix of T is diagonal. You can never hope to find an, I mean, in general, you can't hope to find an orthonormal basis where it, the matrix has this nice form. However, it is true if you replace the word diagonal with upper triangular. So suppose T is an operator on V. Then if T has an upper triangular matrix, with respect to some basis of V, in other words, there's some choice of basis so that the matrix of T is upper triangular, then T has an upper triangular matrix with respect to an orthonormal basis of V. Which is again, not true if you replace the word upper triangular with diagonal. Okay, and in order to prove this result, we just need to remember what we learned about what it means to say that you, your, the matrix is upper triangular with respect to this basis. Okay, so suppose T is upper triangular. The matri I, I guess I should say the matrix of T. So T has, an, T has an upper triangular matrix with respect to the basis, say V1 up through Vn.
Okay, but that means that, well, one way to say this is that if you look at the span of the first j vectors for, for any j, this is invariant under t. This was one of the equivalent ways to say that t was upper triangular with respect to this basis, that if you look at all the first j vectors for any j, so v1 or v1, v2 or v1, v2, v3, that the span of those vectors is invariant under t. OK, now just apply Gram-Schmidt. This is generally, <laughs> like I said last time, this is the way that you actually get orthonormal bases. So apply Gram-Schmidt to this list to obtain an orthonormal list. Uh, E1 up through En. And at each stage, your span remains unchanged. This was the, I mean, this is an important feature of the Gram-Schmidt process. You get an orthonormal basis, but at each stage you aren't changing the subspace that the vectors span. Well, these uh, are the same thing. So this means that for every J, uh, the span of, Oh my gosh. So for all J, for all J, the span of E1 up through N is invariant under T. Because it's the same thing. I mean, this span is the same thing as this span. This means that T is upper triangular, the matrix of T. So T has an upper triangular matrix. With respect to uh, the orthonormal basis. Uh, E1 up through EN. All right, so oftentimes the answer I mean, the way that you prove stuff like this, that oh, some statement which involves the word basis, that you can replace that, the word basis with the word, the phrase or the normal basis. The proof is essentially just, oh, just do Gram-Schmidt. Okay, and then we also saw, it feels like a long time ago, uh, that as if you're working over the complex numbers, you can always find a basis of B such that the operator T has an upper triangular matrix. If you combine that with this, if you work over C for any linear operator T, you can always find an orthonormal basis such that the matrix of T is upper triangular. So this result, it's actually a corollary, right? It's just you com combine two results we already proved, is called Shor's theorem. So it's just suppose V is a finite dimensional vector space over C. Or complex vector space. And T is any operator you want on V. Then again, as I said, we already saw that there's a matrix. I mean, there's a basis such that the matrix of T is upper triangular. But this proposition tells us that in fact, that means that there's an orthonormal basis such that the matrix of T is upper triangular. So then T has an upper triangular matrix. Uh, with respect to some orthonormal basis of B. And this is called Shor's theorem, which means that it's useful. People only name things if they end up using them a lot. Because basically this says that if, as long as you want to work over the complex numbers, if you choose any operator that you want, you can always find a super nice basis of your vector space for that operator. 
right? You can't always expect to be able to get something diagonal, but you can always get something upper triangular, which is, you know, I would say like half as good as being diagonal. And then even you can make those vectors orthonormal, even, which is even more nice. These kinds of things could really speed up your computations if you were working with actual matrices and actual vectors, say. Okay. The next thing uh, is this. So recall this. I'm not going to ask you to recall too far back. Uh, we saw, <coughs> sorry, that if you fix a vector u. D, then the function, this is going to be a function from V to F that takes little v to V inner product with u, right? So what you're doing is you're fixing a vector u. And what your function does is it takes every vector and it inner products it with that same u. That spits out a scalar. So this gives you a function from V to F. And we proved that this, actually, this is just by the axioms of an inner product, I guess. But we proved that this map is a linear map. All right, why? Because v plus w u, right? This is what happens when you plug v plus w into the function. This is v u plus w. That's by the fact that for an inner product, it's additive in the first slot. And that's exactly right. It's like if you plug in W, you get W U. If you plug in V plus W, you get V plus W U. And we proved exactly that if you plug in V plus W, it's the same thing as plugging in V, plugging in W, and then adding. And also lambda V U equals lambda V U. In other words, this function is a linear functional on V. Right, this function is, a, is an element of V dual. So let's just be very concrete. Let's look at an example. So let's say the function, let's call it phi from F3 to F defined by uh, phi of what is this going to be? Let's just say that I define a, a linear map like this. All right. This is just a classic linear map from F3 to F. You can, you can check that this is the same thing as the matrix or multiply by the matrix uh, 3, 2, negative 1, right? Times the vectors z1, z2, z3. So you could think of this as a linear map that's given by this matrix multiplication. Or you can think of the fact that what phi does to a vector z is it returns the inner product with the vector 3, 2, negative 1 for the normal dot product. All right, so this linear map, if you pick the vector u, so i.e., let u equal the vector 3, 2, negative 1, then phi is just the map that. takes the inner product with you, right? It's like the little thing in the, on the top of this slide. So here's two ways to think of the same linear map. Okay, but one question you could ask is, can every linear map from V to F, can you realize it as taking 
the inner product with some vector, right? So for this linear map, for this guy, we, we found a vector so that what it actually is doing is taking the inner product, right? Which we know has to be a linear map. So the question is, if phi is any linear map from V to F, right, or in V dual, or phi from V to F, however you want to write it, is there a u in v such that what phi does is it just takes the inner product with, with u. Right. To me, this is, the answer to this question seems highly non-obvious. Right? Uh, why can't there be some kind of crazy linear map that isn't just inner producting with a vector, right? It seems like there should be tons of linear maps in the world. How can they possibly all be given by, or represented by, taking the inner product with some vector? Vector. Let me give you some. Let me give you an example. Uh, let's take the inner product. Right. My favorite place for unintuitive examples. The inner product on the space of polynomials degree less than or equal to two, our normal one. The inner product of P and Q is the integral, the definite integral from negative one to one of P of X, Q of X, DX. And now let's consider the function. So this would be phi, this will be a linear map from P to R to R. So a linear functional defined by what phi does to a polynomial is it integrates it from negative one to one, p of x cosine of x dx. Uh, okay, well, pi of x, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. So you can check that this is linear. You should, I guess. It's a, it's a quick thing. It just uses the additivity properties of integrating. Okay, so this is some crazy function, functional. What it does, it takes a polynomial, it multiplies it by cosine of pi x, and then it integrates from negative one to one. Now, can you express this function as taking the inner product with some fixed polynomial? So does there exist a polynomial such that this crazy function that I've written down is just the inner product with you? If you ask me what I would expect out of this, it seems like the answer to this question must definitely be no, right? Because it seems like, seems like you need to take what, what would you take for u? It seems like you need to take u to be cosine of pi x. And this is not in P2 of r. That would be my naive thought. Well, if it, right, if there were a vector, it seems like it should have to be cosine of pi x, and that's not a vector in the correct vector space. So it seems like this, there's no hope that you could find a polynomial that does the same thing as the function cosine of pi x with respect to this inner product. Okay, on the other hand, so it seems like no, maybe? I'm very convinced by this argument. I don't know about you. On the other hand, let's think about it this way. This process that we described here takes a vector u and v and spits out a linear functional from v to f, right? So what we have is we have a map from v to v dual that takes a vector u and v 
and maps it to the function where you just take the inner product with you. This is what, what's happening, right? Well, we know that these spaces have the same dimension. So it's like there's, there's like n dimension worth of vectors to pick here, and there's n dimension worth of different linear functionals on B. They sort of seem to match up in size. So maybe it is possible that every time you do this, you get a different linear functional here which somehow means that you should get all of them just heuristically. So maybe, yes. I would say genuinely, when I think about the top half of this page, I think, ah, oh, definitely not. When I think about the bottom half of this page, I think, ah, oh, yeah, maybe. Okay, but uh, this is linear algebra which means that the answer to every question you could possibly ask is, oh, it's the nicest answer possible. So it turns out the answer is yes. And it, this result is called the Reese representation theorem. It's called the Reese representation theorem because every linear functional can be represented by taking the inner product with some vector, even if it wasn't initially defined that way. Right? So here, this linear map, phi, was not initially defined by taking an inner product with a vector. It was initially defined maybe by a matrix or just by this equation. However, you can find a vector such that actually what the linear map is doing is taking the inner product with that vector. Similarly, this function phi is not currently defined by taking an inner product with a vector in the vector space, because cosine pi x is not in the vector space. It turns out, though, that we'll be able to find a vector, a polynomial, such that this function is the same thing as taking the inner product with that polynomial. In other words, we can represent this function as taking an inner product with some polynomial. Again, a fact that I think should be very surprising to you. It is to me. Probably not surprising to any analysts in the world, but surprising to me. Okay, so this is called the Reese representation theorem, as I said, because you can represent any linear functional via an inner product. So suppose V is a finite dimensional vector space. Of course, I mean inner product space. In all of chapter six, when I say vector space, I mean inner product space. And suppose that phi is any linear functional, any element of B dual, then there exists a unique U in B such that what phi does is it just takes the inner product with U for every B and B. Every linear functional can be represented as take the inner product with some fixed vector. Okay, here's the proof. Okay, so let's let phi be any element that we want in B dual. First, we need to show that there exists a U, then we'll show that there's only one U. Okay, so first, U exists. So what we'll do is we'll choose an orthonormal basis of V. By the way, I probably haven't said this enough during this class. So sometimes there are proofs that it's very clear what to do. Sometimes there are proofs where it's not that clear what to do, but once you see a proof, you realize that it works, right? And in order to come up with a proof, it would take a long time of trying to figure out how things are working. I would say that this is not a proof that's particularly obvious to me how you should prove it, until once you see the proof and you understand it, you're like, oh yes, that works. Okay, so right, obviously most mathematics that people care about is of the variety where it's not obvious how to solve something, but then you can see that the solution works. And math is like 
probably doing math is probably NP complete or something. Okay, so we can choose an orthonormal basis of B. Uh, then we can write, we saw, well, we know that you can write V as a linear combination of the E's, but we even know what the coefficients are. We just take the inner product because this is an orthonormal basis. So these are things that we proved already. Okay, what does this mean? Hence, okay, I, sh I should have said pick V and V. Any V you want and write it like this. Now, if we think about what phi does to V, well, phi of V is just phi of this whole thing. Uh, that's a parenthesis. And phi is linear which means that you can break it up over the sum and you can pull out the scalars. Each of these inner products is a scalar, right? So by using linearity of phi, you can write it like this. Uh, v en phi en. Now you can push the phi's Right, these phi's are also scalars, right? So you can push them into the second coordinate of the inner product, but you have to take the complex conjugate, right? So this is equal to v. Uh, let's write it like this: phi of e one bar e one uh, plus dot 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 v phi of e n bar e n. So the first step was by linearity of phi. And uh, yeah, just by linearity of phi and the fact that the v, the inner products were scalars. The second one is by the fact that you can push a scalar into the second slot at the expense of taking a complex conjugate. And now we can use the linearity of the inner product in the second slot, or sorry, the additivity of the inner product in the second slot to write this as the inner product of V with the sum of these vectors. So what phi does to V is it just takes the inner product with this vector. This is our vector U. And it doesn't depend on V, right? Every, for every vector V, you do the same process, you get the same U. In other words, what phi does is it just takes the inner product with this specific vector U. Okay, so for all V and V, phi of V is just the inner product of V with U, where U is something that I underlined there. It's kind of magic, I think. But once you see it, you're like, oh yeah, that does work. Right? All you have to do is choose this orthonormal basis, which involves some kind of inner producting, and then just use some, some basic linearity additivity properties. Okay, uniqueness is actually an easier thing. So U is unique. All right, so suppose that there exists two vectors, U1, U2, such that phi of V is both the inner product of U1 and the inner product with U2 for all V in V. Okay, well, what this means is that zero is v, uh, v u1 inner product minus inner product of v u2. And again, you're still additive in the second coordinate. So this is for all v and v. Okay, but in particular, so, so this is supposed to hold for every v and v. In particular, you can choose u1 minus u2. This will mean that u1 minus u2, inner product with u minus u2 is zero. But we saw that the only vector that if you take the inner product with itself is zero is the zero vector. This implies that u1 minus u2 equals zero, which means that u1 equals u2, which means that the vector u that we chose was unique. Okay, so kind of an amazing theorem, I think. 
and really nothing too crazy in the proof either. I mean, of course, we spent a long time developing these orthonormal bases. So you could say we put a lot of work in there. That's true. Uh, but once you've done that, this proof is just essentially just a, a clever computation. Okay, let me go back to, to this idea, though, of uh, this map from V to V dual. So back to this map. Let's call this map capital Phi. What it does is it takes a vector u and it sends it to the linear map that's given just by interproducting with u, right? This is, this is a, a linear map on V. What the Reese representation theorem says, what does it say in terms of this phi? If I were a YouTube star of a linear algebra program, I would tell you to pause the video and, and tell me what the Reese representation theorem says about this, this phi. The Reese representation theorem says that every vector in here, every linear functional on V can be represented by such a U. So it says that phi is surjective because every linear functional is in the image of phi. It's one of these inner products of u. Also, it says that there's a unique u. So there's only one. So for each linear functional, there's only one u that maps over to it. So it's and that phi is injective, the two different parts of the theorem. So the Reese representation theorem says that this map is a bijective map. All right, so you combine this together, you get that phi is bijective. All right, of course we knew that these two vector spaces had the same dimension. There's, so there's lots of bijective maps between them. We didn't know that this particular map was bijective. I will note though that one reason that we didn't state it in this kind of language is because phi is not a linear map. It's good to see some things in linear algebra that aren't linear maps. At least if you work over C. I guess it is a linear map if you work over R. Why is this? Because if you take phi of lambda u, what is that? That's the function that takes the inner product with lambda u. If you take phi of u, that's the function that takes the inner product with u. But because this lambda u is in the second slot, this is the same thing as lambda bar of the function. I'm being a little bit loose here with these inner product dashes to represent functions. But the point is, is that lambda phi of u and phi of lambda u are not the same thing. There, you can't pull out a scalar, you uh, need to take the conjugate. So this says that over C, this function phi is not linear. However, over R, it, it is a linear map. So you could say that this map phi gives you an isomorphism between these two things if you're working over R, but not over C. Okay, so what you should do at this point. And what I will let you do on your own is there was this kind of crazy function from P2R to R, this linear function on P2R, that isn't obviously, I mean, where it's not obvious what polynomial you can take the inner product with to give this function. So what you should do well, but okay, but the Reese representation theorem says that there is such a polynomial. What you should do at this point is compute that polynomial. And it turns out that for every other degree two polynomial or less, multiplying by that polynomial and integrating from negative one to one gives you the same result as multiplying by cosine of pi x and integrating from negative one to one. Okay, and this is in your book. At least the answer is in your book. However, I think you should do it and not me. 
So this is an exercise to the listener. Find the, find the vector u for the map phi, which takes a vector p to the integral of p of x cosine of pi x dx. How do you do it? You just use the, resource, use the proof of the resource representation theorem. What you do is you take phi, that's the integral in our case. Um, okay, first, you need an orthonormal basis. But last lecture, we came up with an orthonormal basis. So that work is done. Maybe I can even remember what the orthonormal basis is. So P2 of R has orthonormal basis. If I can do this correctly, it'll be a miracle. So you should, you should check. I think it was square root of 1 half, square root of 3 over 2 x, and then like the square root of 45 over 8 x squared minus 3. Oof. If that's correct, that's a minor miracle. Yeah, of course it's not correct. Uh, minus 1 third. But that was pretty close to correct. You got, you got a, that was like a half miracle. All right, so this is uh, an orthonormal basis of the space. What you do is you just plug this orthonormal basis into phi, which means that you'll have to take some kind of integrals. These are some kind of trig integrals. I'm not saying it's going to be fun to do. That's why I'm not doing it. And then you use this proof of the resource representation theorem. So you plug it into phi, you take the complex conjugate, you multiply it by the polynomial, and then you add them up. And it turns out that that special polynomial is the one on this vector space, which is the same thing as multiplying by cosine of pi x and then integrating from negative 1 to 1. OK, so do this on your own. You know, or, or, or not. Do whatever you want. All right, so this takes us, that's the end of 6b on Monday? On Monday, we'll talk about uh, 6c.